We might get started. There may be a few people coming in. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, uh, have Marika present her uh, PhD completion seminar today. She joined me first as an honour student when we were at the Murdoch uh, Children's Research Institute and has seen the transition from there to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. And today she's going to tell you some of her work from her PhD about the role of Hoxby 8 in uh, immortalisation of myeloid cells, a story that actually probably started in this institute in the sort of swinging 60s, so we're, we're bringing it uh, into the 2000s. Thanks, Marika. Thanks, Paul, for that introduction. Okay, so yes, I will be um, informing you all about the role of HOXP8 in myeloid cell immortalization. So a little bit about HOX genes to begin with. HOX genes are a family of transcription factors, all containing two exons. Um, they are characterised by a DNA binding domain termed the homeo domain, which is found in the second exon. Hox genes were first discovered in Drosophila and then found in all bilaterian organisms. They're um, very important in embryonic development, um, defining the um, regional fates of um, axial domains in the developing embryo. The more complex the organism usually, the greater the number of Hox genes it has. Mammals have 39 Hox genes, shown here, clustered um, uh, into four different loci, A, B, C, and D. And there's the presence of homologous Hox genes, um, shown in similar colors, colors here, between C. elegans and Drosophila. Um, Hox genes exhibit a phenomenon termed spatial collinearity in which genes of the, um, that are found in the three prime, uh, three prime posterior of the cluster are expressed in more posterior regions, and genes in the five prime of the cluster are expressed in more anterior regions. Hox genes can also interact with cofactor proteins, and they do this through the hexapeptide domain. This domain is linked um, to the homeo domain via a linker sequence, which varies in size from Hox gene to Hox gene. Um, when lining up the homo domains and, the, and hexapeptide motifs of the malian Hox genes as well as their orthologs in C. elegans, you can see that these regions are the most highly conserved um, of, of the Hox genes. In particular, this tryptophan uh, residue in the hexapeptide motif, which is shown to be absolutely essential for the binding of Hox genes to their cofactors. Um, the pre-B cell or PBC homeobox family is that which binds um, most commonly to Hox genes. Um, it is known as PBX in mammals, EX in Drosophila, and CH20 and CH40 in C. elegans. The binding of these proteins to the DNA has been um, sold with Hox genes, and in this case HoxB1, binding to PBX via the hexapeptide motif in a region that's just, um, just past the third alpha helix of the PBX homeo domain. Hox and uh, PBX uh, proteins can also bind to DNA. So Hox genes are required for various developmental processes in mammals, and um, their abnormal expression can result in um, very detrimental um, effects. And I've listed some various ones here. Um, Hox, a, Hox 11 genes are required for kidney formation. The knockout of all three Hox genes will prevent any kidneys from forming in the mouse. Hox 13 genes are required for normal digit formation and number. Um, abnormal Hox 13 expression has been implicated in syn polydactyly with the fusion of digits. Hox B8 is required for normal gooing behaviour in mice. Hox B8 uh, mice lacking this gene show um, can groom themselves to death. Surprisingly, it is found that um, repopulating these Hox B8 knockout mouse with wild type bone marrow can um, rescue this particular phenotype, indicating some sort of role in microglial cells in neuronal activity. Also, Hox A9 is required for normal lymphocyte number um, with knockout um, uh, cells here. Um, found in lower levels. They also, um, uh, uh, HOXA9 is also responsible for um, in vivo response to GCSF. So HOXB8 was actually the first HOX gene to be um, found in a hematopoietic cell. It was in the leukemic setting. But since then, um, 
the expression of Hokshin's hematopoiesis has been characterised further. In general, you find more um, genes from the Hoxe cluster expressed in HSCs, and um, expression differs depending on the differentiation um, program the HSCs undertake. Hox genes from all four clusters be, can be found along myelodifferentiation. Um, Hox B uh, cluster genes are found um, expressed as cells undergo granulocytic differentiation. In activated T, B and NK cells, you also see the increased expression of genes from the Hox B cluster. However, it's not, um, these expression of these genes are not absolutely required for normal hematopoiesis. For example, the knockout of the entire Hox B cluster still results in normal hematopoiesis. So abnormal Hox gene expression, uh, in particular um, overexpression of Hox genes, can result in defects in normal differentiation and can also contribute to the formation of leukemias. And I've listed some examples here. Hox A5, for example, when overexpressed, can increase myelopoiesis while blocking erythropoiesis. Hox B4 is a well-known Hox gene where its overexpression can increase the self-renewal capacity, uh, self capacity of HSCs by more than 40 times. Hox A9, its increased expression can increase myelopoiesis and in mice can induce AML after a long latency. Hox A9 overexpression is also found in human leukemias. It's often found overexpressed in leukemias characterized by MLL rearrangements. And actually found it was necessary for Hox A9 expression as, a, um, as siRNA mediated downregulation of Hox A9 resulted in cell death of MLL rearranged leukemic cell lines. Um, certain Hox genes, including A9, can be part of a fusion protein with a nucleoporin protein called NUP98. Um, in mice, retrovirally over, um, overexpressed in cells, it can inject it into mice, it can create a myeloproliferative disease, um, which can progress to AML after a long latency. In humans, this fusion protein has been found in um, chronic myeloid leukemia samples, as well as um, pati uh, patients with post-therapy AML. Okay, so um, my gene um, that I focused on was the overexpression of HOXB8. And it was, first, it was the first HOX gene discovered um, to be implicated in leukemia formation. And it was found to be overexpressed in a promyelitic cell line named wehi 3 b This cell line originated from Balb uh, C-mouse given treatments of mineral oil, paraffin, for the induction of plasma cell tumors. And this work was done in 1969 by Warner, Moore, and Metcalf. Consequent transplant generations of this leukemia, which was termed subline B, generated a change in behavior that gave it the potential to grow in vitro. Um, it was found that these wehi 3 b cell lines could support in vitro colony growth of normal bone marrow uh, cells without the addition of uh, CSFs in culture. Um, it was then found almost 20 years later that um, HOXB8 was overexpressed in these cell lines due to an IAP insertion, a retroviral element upstream of exon 1, uh, upstream of the start codon in exon 1, resulting in its overexpression. Um, and then the, the ability of these cell lines to support in vitro growth was, growth was then found uh, by, out by the ability that uh, of by the, um, by the detection of an IAP insertion upstream of IL-3, which was um, uh, also inducing its overexpression. So wehi 3 b cell lines, when injected into mice, can form an, a very aggressive leukemia. A PhD student in the, in the early 90s here at WeHi, Andrew Perkins, um, wanted to determine um, how HOXB8 and IL-3 contributed to the development of leukemia. So what he did, he created a model in which he um, transduced bone marrow progenitor cells with either IL retrovirus containing IL-3 and HOXB8, HOXB8 only or IL-3 only, then injected these cells into lethally irradiated mice and looked for tumour progression. When he injected cells into lethally irradiated mice that were overexpressing IL-3 and HOXB8, 
The mice died to, due to an aggressive myeloid leukemia with a short latency time similar to the WeHi 3B cell lines. He saw elevated levels of both immature and mature myeloid cells that had infiltrated the spleen, marrow, blood, lung, and muscle. When he injected cells that overexpressed IL-3 only, mice also died. However, this was due to just a myeloproliferative disease. Elevated levels of mature myeloid cells in the spleen, marrow, and blood. When he um, injected uh, brain representatives overexpressing HOXP8 only, mice were able to survive. When he sacrificed these mice, he found that there were a greater number of myeloprogenitors in the spleen and bone marrow, and he assessed this in vitro. So taking cells from the spleen, he um, cultured them in vitro in SCM or IL-3 media, and looked for their in vitro soft egg or colony formation, and found that cells that overexpressed HOXP8 HOX had a greater potential in forming colonies than cells are expressing an empty vector. It is possible to create an in vitro cell line by overexpressing HOXP8 and um, IL-3, with IL-3 either supplied endogenously, endogenously or exogenously. These progenitor cells, um, immortalized with HOXP8, have a myeloid phenotype and look very similar to the WeHi 3B cells. It was suggested back then that HOXP8 could be contributing to leukemia by preventing myeloid progenitor cell differentiation. And my PhD project was to determine whether it was doing this or whether it had also other effects in myeloid cell um, immortalization. So the aims of my project were to create a model in which we could examine HOXP8 immortalized myeloid progenitor cell behavior in the presence and absence of HOXP8 expression, to characterize the cell behavior when HOXP8 was no longer overexpressed, and to determine how HOXP8 regulated this observed cell behavior. So the first aim, to establish conditional expressed HOXP8 and observe the effects after HOXP8 withdrawal. So to establish this model, we started off with a population of um, cells taken from C57 black 6 mice, and in particular the fetal liver from these mice at E14. We sorted cells to be CKIT positive and excluded any cells um, positive for lineage cell markers. So these CKIT positive cells were kept in culture overnight with IL-3 and SCF, and the next day we were infected with cells uh, we infected cells with the 4-HT inducible HOXP8 lentivirus in the presence of IL-3 and SCF. And with this um, inducible lentivirus, the addition of 4-HT um, could induce HOXP8 expression. After lentiviral infection and the integration of the lentivirus into the host genome, this fusion protein called GF16 is produced. It's a fusion protein containing a GAL4 transcription factor, which can bind to the UAS promoter sites upstream of HOXP8, together with a transcriptional activator, VP16, and an estrogen receptor. This estrogen receptor is responsive to the 4-HT. When 4-HT is absent from the cell, the GV6 fusion protein is held in the cytoplasm by heat shock protein 90. Once 4-HT is added, it binds to the estrogen receptor on the GV16, allowing it to then translocate into the nucleus, where the GAL4 can bind to the UAS and induce expression of HOXP8. Only in the presence of 4-HT do we get HOXP8 expression. Other, there are other systems that have been used where the estrogen receptor is, has actually been fused to HOXP8. In this case, HOXP8 is constitutively made and held in the cytoplasm um, until 4-HG is added, where the ER fusion HOXP8 is then translocated into the nucleus. In these cases, HOXP8 is always present, however, held in the cytoplasm. Our system is much cleaner because it's only when you add 4-HT um, does HOXP8 appear in the cell, is HOXP8 induced. So once we infected these cells with a lentivirus, we cultured them in IL-3 and 4-HT to induce HOXP8 expression, and we selected cells um, that were successfully infected with puromycin. We were able to create a continuous, non-adherent cell line with inducible HOXP8 expression, and we tested this inducibility by Western blood. 
These wild type cells, we withdrew 4-HT for a total of six days, and by the fourth day, we were no longer able to detect levels by Western blot. It was also possible to re-add 4-HT to these cells and get re-expression. So now that we had created a cell line, we wanted to determine whether it was dependent on Hox B8 and IL-3 for survival before doing any other Hox B8 withdrawal experiments. So we had a look at um, the, um, whether Hox, the overexpression of Hox B8 was promoting colony formation, and this was indeed the case. We took CK positive um, progenitor cells, infected the, them with the 4 ht induced full antivirus in the presence of IL-3, and either added 4-HT or not. And it was only when we added 4-HT to induce Hox beta expression did we get robust colony formation. We did see a few colonies um, growing when we did not add 4-HT, which indicated some um, leakiness in the system. When we infected cells um, with a lentivirus expressing GFP and adding 4-HT to induce GFP expression, we did not um, get any colonies whatsoever. Um, these cells were also dependent on IL-3. Um, Hox beta immortalized cells were cultured in soft agar either in the presence of IL-3 alone, SCF alone and GMCSF alone. And once again, only in the presence of IL-3 were we able to um, get robust colony formation. These cells were also um, sensitive to IL-3 withdrawal 48 hours after we withdrew IL-3 from the media. Um, majority of cells were in XN5 NPI um, uh, prior positive. Oh, sorry, not positive. <laughs> so what we found was Hox B8, um, these cell lines were Hox B8 dependent, were IL-3 dependent, and were not cloningenically viable in the presence of other cytokines. So the first thing we did was to have a look at what happened to the differentiation of these cells after we removed 4-HT. So we washed 4-HT out of the media and after six days looked at surface marker expression. We found that in the presence of 4-HT in IL-3, where Hox B8 is overexpressed, all cells expressed a myeloid marker, CD11B, and the majority of them also expressed F480. No cells now expressed, or hardly any cells expressed CKIT, and very few cells expressed various other um, lineage cell markers. When we removed 4-HT, and this was for six days, we not, did not really see a change in the number of cells expressing these certain markers. When we had a look at, um, at, the, um, at CD11B and F480, we did see a shift in fluorescence intensity after 4-HT withdrawal, with the um, red histogram here indicating, um, a red peak indicating unstained cells, and the um, solid black line indicating cells cultured in just IL-3. When we added IL uh, GMCSF to cells cultured with IL-3 in the absence of 4-HT, again, we saw, not, saw no difference in um, uh, surface marker expression, particularly um, in the case where 4-HT was removed and kept just in IL-3. Differentiation, however, was observed when we looked at cells via May Grunwald and GM sustaining. When we removed 4-HT expression, uh, 4-HT, and again, this was after six days, cells cultured in just IL-3 um, became much larger. The larger cytoplasm um, with the presence of also um, ring form and lobulated nuclei. The addition of GMCF, GMC -CF to cultures with IL-3 in the absence of 4-HT resulted in cells with a much even larger morphology with the same similar, um, similar characteristic of the, of the nucleus. So um, these cells after 4-HT withdrawal were undergoing um, myeloid differentiation. <clears throat> what we also observed when um, we removed 4-HT from the cells was that cell number did decrease over time. And this was taken up to 18 days after 4-HT withdrawal. Surprisingly, when we re-added 4-HT and re-expressed Hox B8, 
we were able to re-establish cell number in culture. When looking at DNA contents by HypoPI, we saw that after the withdrawal of 4-HT, cells would exit S phase and enter G1. Now this was in when cells were continuously cultured in the presence of IL-3. When we re-added 4-HT to cultures at day three, we could um, generate some um, re-entry into um, cell cycle where cells um, entered S phase and exited G1. What we also observed following 4-HT withdrawal was that cells progressively lost viability, where up to 12 days after 4-HT withdrawal, almost around 20% percent of cells were dead. We could re-add 4-HT at day three and what we observed was cells progressively restored their viability. This took some time, um, and it was probably because um, uh, by the time Hox was re-expressed into the cell, this would have been about day three after re-addition, day six, before it was able to, to um, restore the viability in a proportion of the cells. So, the summary of AIM-1. Hoxbier could be tightly controlled using the 4-HT inducible system. The overexpression of Hoxbier and IL-3 were required for survival of cells, and SCF and GMCSF cannot substitute for IL-3. Using this Hoxbier inducible system, Hoxbier immortalizes the cells that, exit, uh, that exhibit a myeloid phenotype. And after 4-HT withdrawal, a proportion of cells undergo myeloid differentiation. All cells exit S phase and enter G1. Most cells undergo cell death, and the proportion have, of cells have the ability to re-enter the cell cycle and restore cell viability. So our second aim it was, was to establish the mediator of the cell death that was occurring after Hox B8 withdrawal. So when we, um, when we observed the effects of Hox B8 withdrawal, the re decreasing cell cycle, and um, the decrease in cell viability. These were all effects that we saw after the withdrawal of IL-3. IL-3 withdrawal or cytokine deprivation in these Hox B8 dependent um, myeloprogenitor cells has been well characterized and has been found to uh, be dependent on the activation of the intrinsic cell death pathway. This pathway is dependent on the activation of two proteins back and back to mediate the release of cytochrome C, the formation of the apoptosome complex, and activation of caspases. In the context of IL-3 withdrawing these cells, the removal of BAX and BAC prevents any cell death from occurring. So we wanted to know and to determine whether the cell death occurring after Hox B8 withdrawal um, was also due to the intrinsic pathway and dependent on the proteins BAX and BAC. So before we went on, we wanted to have a look whether the cell death was dependent on caspases. And we tested this by adding a caspase inhibitor, QVD, to cells cultured in the absence of 4-HT. What we observed was cells, and this was at a six-day time point after 4-HT withdrawal, if QVD was, was added, cells would no longer undergo cell death, indicating that the cell death after oxbate withdrawal was um, caspase dependent. To look at whether BACs and BAC were required for the cell death after 4-HT withdrawal, we immortalized fetal liver cells from BACs back double knockout cells and withdrew 4-HT. Over a nine day period of 4-HT withdrawal, we do not see any cell death occurring in these cells, showing us that it was a BACs back dependent mechanism that was inducing this cell death. There are many proteins involved in the activation uh, in the, of the intrinsic cell death pathway. Therefore, we wanted to have a look at whether Hox speed expression was influencing the expression of um, any of these proteins. So this panel here is a representative um, panel of several clones that we have tested. This was done in wild type um, Hox speed immortalized progenitor cells. We withdrew 4-HT for a total of six days but we also re-added 4-HT on the fourth day after 4-HT withdrawal. 
and took it out to six days after 4-HT reddition. What we saw consistently across all clones, that when HOXB8 was overexpressed, BIM levels were repressed. When, we, uh, when HOXB8 levels fell, BIM levels increased. The re-addition of HOXB8 um, resulted gradually in the decrease of BIM. It's not observed here, but this was because at day six, there's still um, apoptotic cells in the culture dish. Um, there are some changes observed here in several other proteins, like the overexpression, of, uh, the expression of BIM BMF increases after 4-HT withdrawal. You also see um, an increase in MCL1, which uh, also increases once we also once we re-add 4-HT to cultures. But these changes weren't consistent across all the clones that we tested. It was only that of BIM um, that was always the same. We had a look at the mRNA levels of BIM to see whether um, the withdrawal of HOXB8 also resulted in an increase in BIM mRNA levels, and this was the case. So we wanted to um, then ask whether BIM expression was essential for the apoptosis that was induced after HOXB8 withdrawal. So we were able to immortalize um, fetal liver cells from a BIM knockout mice with HOXB8 create a cell line with inducible HOXB8 expression, and we withdrew 4-HT to withdraw HOXB8 expression. And what we found was um, HOXB8 immortalized progenitors immortalized in the absence of BIM still um, underwent cell death, however, at a slower rate than wild-type progenitor cells. They approached but did not reach cell death um, this, uh, as seen by wild-type cells at day nine. So this suggested to us that cells, since cells were still undergoing apoptosis, there must be another back and back dependent, BIM independent mechanism involved in their cell death. What we um, wanted to ask though was, after 4-HT withdrawal, BAC's back and BIM now cells had a survival advantage. Were these cells, no longer able to die or die at a slower rate after 4-HT withdrawal, were they able to renew the self potential when re-added re 4-HT to cultures more so than wild-type cells? Um, cell cycle um, in back-spec double knockout cells after 4-HT withdrawal um, decreased with cells um, in, in S phase decreasing by day six, with increasing cells in G1. Um, we also see a decrease in um, cells in S phase in both BIM NALM and wild type cells by day six. So to determine whether BAC's BAC and BIM knockout cells had a clinogenic advantage um, when 4-HT was re-added to them after a period of 4-HT withdrawal, we took wild type BAC's BAC and BIM, um, BAC's BAC double knockout on BIM cells um, cultured them in the absence of 4-HT and re-added and uh, put them in soft agar with 4-HT at 0, 3 and 7 days. What we found was BAC's BAC, double knockout and BIM knockout cells were no more able to form colonies um, after 4-HT withdrawal than wild type cells. So the ability of these cells to remain alive after 4-HT withdrawal did not make them more, um, more um, likely to form colonies when 4-HT was re-added to them. This indicated that the self-renewal potential of cells was um, involving mechanisms that were backs back and BIM independent. So the summary of the second aim. We found that backs and back were absolutely essential for the cell death occurring after HOXB8 withdrawal. BIM protein and mRNA levels are repressed in conditions of HOXB8 overexpression and elevated once HOXB8 levels decrease. BIM null HOXB8 immortalized progenitor still cells still succumb to cell death, but at a slower rate than wild type progenitors. And there are other HOXB8 dependent, back SPAC and BIM independent mechanisms that are required to maintain the self renewal capabilities of these cells. 
So our third aim to follow one from the second was to establish how HOXBA could be regulating beam expression. And we approached this with the luciferase reporter assay in which the 3.6 kb region upstream of um, the first exon of BIM, the first intron of BIM, and the three prime UTR of BIM, were transiently transfected into 293 cells that stably infected GFP HOXP8, or a mutant form of HOXP8, in which the hexapeptide domain was uh, mutated to residues previously known to almost totally abolish the binding of HOXP8 to PVX. What we found when 293 T cells overexpressed HOXP8, we found a 50% decrease in the amount of luciferase that was coming from the reporter um, assay with a 3' UTR. It's previously, it has been previously shown that there are mechanisms um, involving microRNAs that can regulate um, BIM expression through the 3' UTR. So we decided to take a broad approach and look at the global expression of microRNAs, the change in the presence or the absence of 4-HT. So we took um, three independently generated Hox beta immortalized uh, progenitor cell lines and cultured them in the presence and the four-day absence of 4-HT. With the help of um, Greg Goodall and um, Andrew Burt at the Centre for Cancer Biology in Adelaide, we were able to screen and come up with this heat map here, which is the most significantly changed microRNAs um, between um, plus and minus conditions of HOXB8. And what was interesting to note um, was that um, the microRNAs that had been previously shown to regulate BIM at the 3' UTR came up in the most significantly changed microRNAs. The blue squares here indicate expression, uh, micro exp lower microRNA expression, while the red squares here indicate higher microRNA expression. And with these microRNAs um, previously shown to be involved in BIM 3' UTR regulation, they were um, expressed in higher levels in the presence of HOXB8, um, and their expression decreased in the absence of HOXB8. We validated um, um, these results by QRT-PCR with three HOXP8, uh, independent HOXP8 um, pools and found that um, we did see the same result where the expression of these MIRs was higher in conditions of HOXP8 overexpression. So a little bit about microRNAs before I go on. They are short 22 nucleotide strands of RNA packaged in stem loop structures. A seed sequence in these tw nuclear, 22 nucleotide strands can bind to complementary sites on the VU3 pri uh, prime UTR or non complementary sites um, to influence post transcriptional activity. MicroRNAs can be found in both coding and non coding regions of the genome and are first packaged into prior microRNAs cleaved by Drosha to form these pre microRNA stem loop structures. They are exported into the cytoplasm and by the action of, of DISA are uh, um, formed into, sing, uh, into double stranded um, duplexes. These duplexes are made into single strands and one strand is incorporated into um, a risk complex which um, facilitates the, the, um, the binding of the microRNA to the mRNA. Usually complementary binding, complete complementary binding of the microRNA to um, the 3' UTR sequence um, can result in mRNA cleavage. Um, Non-complementary or almost complementary binding can result in translational repression. This process is extremely important in the development of embryos and in all aspects of, of, um, of, um, of development. Um, with embryos lacking DISA appearing smaller and not surviving longer than E7.5. So the MIA-1792 cluster of microRNAs, which is the cluster in which the microRNAs known to control BIM are found, um, are a cluster of six microRNAs in a polycystronic transcript. And there are two other um, clusters um, that are, have orthologous microRNAs to MIA-1792. 
They are found in the second exon of the gene, non-coding gene C13 ORF25 or MIA17HG on chromosome 13Q31. MIA1792 is located in a region uh, that is found to be amplified in lymphomas and other cancers in the very oncogenic MIA. Cell uh, MIA1792 knockout mice die minutes before birth, um, are slightly smaller than their wild type counterparts, have severely hypoplastic lungs and heart defects. What's also observed in these, in these knockout mice as a de is a decrease in fetal B cell numbers due to a higher amount of apoptosis in the pro-B cell population, as measured here by a Nexon 5 staining. It's also observed that there's a decrease in B cells and total lymphocytes, in particular pre-B cells, in wild-type mice that are reconstituted with MIA1792 knockout fetal liver. There is a mouse model also where the cluster can be um, knocked out with the expression of MX Cre. And in these pre-B cells, it was found that the, knock the knocking out of this cluster um, induced the expression of BIM. There has been a transgenic mouse model also made that in which MIA1792 is overexpressed in lymphocytes. These mice um, have a, a shorter life expectancy and due to a, a development of a lymphoproliferative disease and autoimmunity. In CD4 T cells in these mice, it's found that they have lower levels of BIM and also another um, predicted target of MIA1792 P10. So, um, we were able to, um, thanks to um, Marco and Leona, um, obtain a, a GFP reporter assay in which the three prime UTR of BIM was cut up further into four segments. So we could narrow down the region in which Hox V8 was regulating uh, BIM expression. Um, so we once again used 293 T cells that were stably infected with Hox V8 or mutant form of Hox V8 or left uninfected. And we stably infected these BIM three prime UTR GFP reporter constructs. Um, when we analysed GFP expression, that we found, what we found was in 293 T cells um, infected with the constructs containing the second and fourth region of the BIM3 prime UTR, we saw a repression in GFP levels. These two segments of the BIM3 prime UTR contain binding sites for 17, 5P, 19 and 92. And these particular regions of the BIM3 prime UTR have been previously shown in the transgenic mouse model to be um, important for the MIA1792 regulation of BIM. So it's quite difficult um, when looking at microRNAs to identify their um, three prime UTR targets. Um, a lot of researchers rely on computer programs to um, identify and place um, matches of seed sequences to um, three prime UTRs. And this can result in many false positives. Because MIA1792 is an oncogenic MIA in which is found overexpressed in, in many different cancer cell types, it's been, these cell lines have been used to identify other genes in which the MIA1792 can regulate. And in several different um, uh, cancer models, um, MIA1792 has also found to repress levels of P21, cyclin D1, E2F1 and P10. So we also wanted to know whether microRNAs um, from this cluster were also regulating genes which were required for the HOXB8 mediated mortalization. So we had a look at um, other genes in our HOXB8 immortalized cell lines and we had a look at three independently generated clones um, um, and then had a look in the presence of uh, 4-HT or in the four-day absence of 4-HT. So together with the, um, with the increase in BIM expression, in two of three clones, we also see a, saw a subtle increase in the levels of P21 expression after 4-HT withdrawal. Um, when looking at P10 expression, rather than an increase, 
um, we saw a slight uh, decrease. However, when looking at the loading control, um, it seems like the total protein levels also decrease in these samples. So it was, it was um, too hard to assess whether P10 um, had any role in, uh, was possibly regulated by MIA 1792. So we wanted to determine how crucial the presence of this cluster was for the repression of BIM and other possible targets as well as the self-renewal potential of these myeloprogenitor cells. So, um, thanks to Marco Herald, we were able to um, get some fetal livers from, MIAS, uh, from mice that had LOXP sites, sites flanking the MIA 1792 cluster. The addition of Cree could remove this, uh, the, entire, the entire cluster. So fetal liver cells were, were immortalised with Hox beta expression, and in this system it was constitutive um, Hox beta expression. Um, we expressed CRE by um, infecting cells with a lentiviral construct, and in, when looking at BIM, we infected cells with the construct in which we could induce BIM expression by the induction of uh, by the addition of doxycycline. So CRE induction using a doxycycline inducible system. So in these plus lanes here, um, we had induced CRE for 72 hours. What we observed, however, was that when we induced CRE in both wild type cells or MIA 1792 flux flux cells, we saw an increase in BIM expression um, regardless of whether cells were able to knock out um, MIA 1792 or not. We also saw an increase in P21 expression as well. So this indicated to us that the expression of CRE um, alone was, um, expressing, was increasing expression levels of BIM and P21, making it difficult to, do, to determine whether um, the knockout of MIA-1792 was having any role in BIM-mediated um, repression or HOXB-mediated repression. However, we had a look at the long-term um, effects of MIA-1792 um, knockout, and we did this by once again immortalizing um, MIA-1792 flux flux cells with HOXB8, and we also in parallel immortalized cells with HOXA9 to have a, another myeloprogenitor cell line that we could examine. And we infected these cells now with the constitutive Cree lentivirus. After infection, we selected these cells with hygromycin for 10 days and then um, analysed their growth in soft agar. And what we observed, that even if cells were treated with CRE, and in the case of the MIA-1792 flux, flux cells had lost the cluster, they were still able to form colonies, both HOXA9 and HOXB8. However, when we genotype these colonies, we found that only 14% of colonies um, from Hoxbeard immortalized cells had uh, deleted both alleles of MIA-1792. This compared to around 50% of HOXA9 immortalized cells. This indicated that, indicated that there was um, an important role for MIA-1792 in Hoxbeard immortalized cells um, for the continued survival and proliferation as there seems like um, in culture there was a selection against cells which had lost um, at least one of these um, alleles. Um, since only around 50% of HOXA9 immortalized progenitor cells um, had still retained at least one allele of MIA-1792, um, um, it indicated that uh, this cluster was also involved perhaps in, uh, in um, allowing the uh, continued survival and proliferation of these cells, however, not to the extent as um, it, it did with HOXB8 immortalized progenitor cells. So, summary of AIM-3. Our reporter assay suggests that HOXB8 is regulating BIM through the three prime UTR. The three prime UTI is a target for microRNAs from the MIA-1792 cluster, some of which are upregulated during HOXB8 overexpression. Our data suggests that HOXB8 requires at least one allele of the MIA-1792 cluster 
for optimal cell survival and proliferation in vitro. And this is specific to HOXB8, as a greater number of HOXA9 immortalized cells could uh, survive the loss of this cluster. And we are yet to determine whether this cluster has the potential to regulate BIM expression in a HOXB8 dependent manner. So, to conclude, HOXB8 immortalized progenitor cells require HOXB8 for continued survival and proliferation. The cell death after HOXB8 withdrawal is dependent on BAC's BAC and in part by BIM. HOXB8 can repress BIM at the 3' UTR, possibly through the actions of microRNAs, in particular those from the MIA1792 cluster, but that still needs to be um, further determined. And HOXB8 immortalized progenitor cells require the presence of the MIA1792 cluster for efficient survival and proliferation. So for our future directions, um, our microRNA array um, came up with quite a few other microRNAs that altered in expression in the presence or absence of 4-HT or HOXB8. So um, our aim now is to determine how important these particular microRNAs, those that were found at low expression overexpressed HOXB8 or those were that were found in higher levels overexpressed HOXB8, are dependent on the self-renewal um, capabilities of HOXB8 overexpression. Um, we want to determine the downstream targets of these microRNAs regulated by HOXB8 to discover further genes involved in myeloid cell immortalization. And this can be done using a mechanism or a technique called Kids Clip, where it's possible to IP the argonaut protein, which is involved in the risk complex, um, which can um, then allow the sequencing of microRNAs and also their corresponding uh, 3 UTR sequence. We also want to determine whether HOXB8 can directly or indirectly bind to the promoter of the MIA1792 cluster. There is a HOX um, binding site in, this, um, in the promoter region upstream of this cluster, and there has not yet been a, um, a direct um, target of HOXB8 um, um, as yet discovered, so it would be good to find one of those. And also, um, we want to see whether in an in vivo setting, this cluster has a role in promoting leukemiogenesis. So I'd just like to thank um, all of the past and present members of um, the Eckert Lab, those from the Goodall Laboratory um, who helped with all the microRNA analyses, John Silk for advice and for vectors, um, Philippe, Michael and David for the use of their mice, um, Matt Burton for help in, with cytometry back when we were still at MCRI, Jocelyn to help with MR, uh, with um, RT, and Hamson and Ross for the help with the luciferase uh, um, reporter assays, and also um, advice from those back at the MCRI, um, Elizabeth and Vinod. Thank you. So we've got some time for questions. David. So at the start you said that uh, uh, OSB8 acts as a dimer with some other partner yes. protein. Do you know what that partner protein is? And uh, if you express that other partner protein together with Hox, um, uh, the 8 would you get a super duper effect? Um, so with, uh, with HOXB8, it's been shown in vitro with recombinant proteins to be able to bind to PBX1, 2 and 3. Um, I've had a little bit of trouble trying to reproduce that data in vivo, but um, some, um, there is very little PBX expressed in these HOXB8 immortalized cell lines to begin with. So I'm not sure whether if we do express PBX, we might be able to get a stronger or you know, cells which may proliferate faster or have a more leukemogenic effect. I'm not entirely sure yet. Yes. Um, we're not sure why. They still, so you would think that because um, 
they're still alive after, let's say, three days after 4-HT withdrawal. We re-add 4-HT. Hox B8 is re-expressed, yet they still can't promote, um, pr produce colonies. And we don't know whether there might be some sort of um, genes involved in um, cell cycle that perhaps um, once Hox B8 has been withdrawn for the first time, um, the re-expression of Hox B8 may no longer promote their activity, thus affecting the potential um, clonogenic uh, uh, activity after we re-add 4-HT again. Um, we're not sure. No, that's next. Yep, definitely want to do that. There is a binding site, but we haven't done a chip. We've worked out we can chip using the cross-linking procedure so we can pull down B8 that way, but we haven't done that <coughs> PCR sequencing. Yet. Did you look at endogenous levels of the cluster in 293PC? Uh, no, we didn't. That's a good point. Yep. Yeah. You're all done, you're all silent. Good, well look, we could just finish by uh, thanking Marika for an excellent presentation.